Okay, so here we are. We're going to talk about sequence A. Sequence A <clears throat> is basically uh, where we all begin. It's where the story begins. It's where we begin to form uh, the story in the audience's mind. Um, uh, the, the first thing that we have to consider is that uh, the audience knows nothing. They don't know anything about anything in terms of what's going to happen on the screen. Um, there's a lot that goes into advertising and posters and commercials and trailers and you know, to set up the audience for some general ideas about what the conflict is, maybe who the main character is, some expectations about the conflict, um, um, maybe setting up a little bit of the tone, uh, maybe setting up the genre, uh, but I think it's safe to assume uh, when we're writing our story that when they sit down, the lights go down, and um, the, the the picture comes up, that they don't know anything, that they're watching and uh, they're starting from scratch, and we have to very carefully and thoughtfully uh, take control of their interest and make sure that they understand the story. Um, uh, as it goes forward. Um, what's playing right now is uh, the beginning of Jaws and uh, what we have here is what's called the hook. We want to begin the film with a hook and uh, with every sequence a way to break the film and the story down is to do so in much more manageable pieces in terms of creating the story, developing the idea. If you're thinking about a feature film, it can be quite daunting and overwhelming to, to try to figure out everything that happens and keep it all in your mind at one time and develop the story in you know some sort of one giant piece. Um, it's, it's a very difficult way to work. Uh, so a, a more manageable way is to break it down into smaller pieces and manage just the beginning, middle, and end of that piece. So uh, the ordinary world or sequence A really does set up some just fundamental aspects of the story. Um, this is, uh, this, like I said, it begins with what's called a hook. It's just got to be, you know, some event that happens, something that you show your audience that engages them, that hooks them, okay? Uh, you know, I just realized the pun now that I'm showing you Jaws and I'm calling it a hook. Uh, but it really is. It, it's supposed to get the audience to want to know what happens next in some broad way because they don't know the characters, they don't know the story, they don't even know this girl's name or that guy's name that's, you know, that's in this particular scene. They don't really even know what's happening to her. Um, and it's setting up some basic questions um, that we want the audience to be engaged in, and uh, ultimately those questions get answered. And certainly as those questions get answered, new, more specific, more important questions get raised that keep the audience engaged. Remember, storytelling... Engaging an audience, keeping them with the story, is about piquing their curiosity, keeping a, game, a, a question in play um, until the very end of the film, when hopefully we've answered all the questions. So um, in that sequence, we saw a hook, um, which is the shark attack, you know, setting up this idea that there's a monster. Um, <clears throat> and in The Matrix, what we have is... Uh, I don't, if you remember the film, where does the story begin? Does it begin with Neo in his off or in his apartment, you know, staring uh, kind of blankly into the screen? Or no, it doesn't. It begins with this sweet sequence with Trinity as she's trying to escape some agents. Um, and um, what it does is it hooks the audience. Who's who's this woman? Why is she dressed in shiny attire? And uh, who are the people trying to chase her? What did she do? And uh, most importantly, it establishes the rules of the world in the story. Uh, she's able to do some pretty amazing things where she, you know, jumps across uh, between buildings and dives through windows and doesn't seem to hurt herself. And, um, you know, that raises a question in the audience's mind. How is this possible? What are the rules of this world and why are the rules that way? Uh, what makes this particular world special? Um, all very important questions and uh, that do get addressed, like I said, they get answered later and, um, and new questions get raised as we go through the story. So uh, more or less, this is the hook. This is what the hook is all about. This is what it's designed to do. 
setting up some idea of the conflict, the character in uh, you know, the world that we're in. Another example would be Star Wars. The opening sequence of Star Wars is you know, some ships flying in space. And it's the Empire uh, you know, basically uh, taking over and, and raiding a rebel ship and trying to you know, capture these robots and the plans and the robots escape. I mean, we don't know any of the characters. We don't know why any of this is happening, but we've established, well, this is a movie that takes place in space, uh, setting up the rules of the world uh, quite quickly. Um, the next thing that you have to decide and where the story should go is setting up what's called the ordinary world. We introduce our main character and we introduce uh, their world, basically. Uh, what is their world like before anything really happens? What, what happens in their world? What is their life like? And one thing that uh, we always want to kind of set up is that, um, you know, their life isn't perfect. Uh, we'll call it equilibrium. We'll call it a state of balance. There's good things and there's bad things in the world. Just you know, before the action or the problems enter their life. And it's important to set that up. And that will become clear later in the story why we need to set that up. Um, there's this notion that characters change through a story, that they grow somehow, that they make some discovery about themselves. And it's true that in a well-told story, a character has external conflict, and that's why they go through the journey they do in the story, but they have internal conflict as well. Uh, the external conflict forces that character to face something inside themselves, something, a problem that they have. I mean, uh, one example I always give is like, you know, you know, is life perfect for you? I mean, uh, is everything perfect for you? Or, 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 or there are some, uh, you know, problems that, you know, we have in our life. I'll just, and what's our strategy? You know, how do we face problems? What's our typical way of handling a problem? Um, we tend to go towards the easiest approach, which is to ignore the problem, you know, to do nothing. That's probably, I mean, hey, if that works, then, you know, hey, problem solved. I didn't have to expend any energy, and wow, that was great. That was easy. Problem solved. Um, in storytelling, you know, let's be realistic here. Our characters should be just like us, and the way they approach, you know, their problems in life is to ignore them. It, you know, we find ourselves in a state of balance, you know. Um, and so that's what we have to show. We establish the who, what, when, where of who the protagonist is, what is their life like, if they have a job, you know, giving the audience a clear picture of, you know, what their equilibrium or their ordinary world is like before anything happens. Um, uh, that comes into play later in the film when they return to the ordinary world at the very end, and we see by comparison to what we what we show them at the beginning of the film, how that character may or may not be different, or may or may not have changed, or may or may not have discovered something about themselves. Uh, so that's where uh, the ordinary world is quite important. Um, if we look at the movie Jaws, we introduce quite uh, quickly Chief Brody and uh, you know his life and you know this main character. Who is he? Where is he? Why is he there? Uh, what is his occupation? And some idea of how he feels about it. And Chief Briotti is a you know chief of police in a very small town of Amity uh, on the East Coast. And uh, he's new there. He's from the big city. And he's probably not so sure he likes you know his job. He's intimidated by it. Uh, he, he, he feels insecure. And, you know, a big aspect of the film is his ability to establish his authority in, or, you know, his inability to establish his authority. So, you know, that's a huge part of his internal journey that gets set up right away. Uh, this is his ordinary world, and uh, we see what that's like before, uh, you know, problems arise. And um, that's important to understand where we're going in at the end of the sequence. The end of the sequence... Um, it is marked by a, a plot point, which we call the inciting incident. And the inciting incident is simply trouble arising. You know, uh, it is something that threatens the ordinary world of the main character. How do we know it threatens the ordinary world? Well, we've just seen what the ordinary world is like. And we've seen enough of it, you know, somewhere between 10 minutes, about 10 minutes of this character doing, going through their daily routine so we recognize what's expected by that character. 
and uh, when the inciting incident occurs, we can very clearly see well, that's this is not what they expect. Um, this is threatening the ordinary world. This is threatening to change things for the character, and we know how we feel about change, right? Every one of us, uh, we're reluctant to uh, to uh, accept it. Um, uh, it can be frightening. It can be um, disorienting. And uh, generally speaking, even things that we don't like in our ordinary world will tend to hang on to them or um, do nothing about them or try to do nothing about them or reluctantly face those problems. Um, and when the inciting incident occurs, uh, it's really a call to action. It's a call to action. A problem comes up and it needs to be addressed and the character is going to uh, move into the next sequence to try to address that problem. So um, uh, one other thing about the inciting incident is that we should understand that uh, the inciting incident is an agent of the main conflict in the film. And the main conflict is simply, well, what's the film about? What is the main conflict? What is the big problem in the story? And uh, it should be simple and straightforward. Um, and it might not be clear to the audience immediately uh, but some aspect, some agent, some part of that story shows up. And, um, you know, it's forming the story in their mind. It's giving the audience just enough information to understand what the characters are immediately dealing with in from one scene to the next. What is their objective? Uh, chief Brody's objective as a chief of police is simply to uh, protect the citizens of Amity. That's what his job is. And uh, there's, there's quite a few things that are working against him. Uh, the mayor's working against him. Um, the, the shark is definitely working against him. Uh, some of the townspeople and their way of dealing with problems is working against them. And of course, internally, his own sense of, um, uh, you know, I don't know what we call it, self-esteem, self-worth. Um, you know, it's working against him. He doesn't feel like he's really the right person for the job, um, and he's reluctant to um, uh, to uh, apply his authority as the police chief. So, here we go. <clears throat> this is uh, this is the ordinary world. I'll show you. Uh, you know, in the Matrix, we go through the sequence where Trinity, you know, escapes the agents, and in in really quite fantastic fashion, if I may say so, in her. Um, in her get up. So this these series of events occur and then here we go ordinary world we meet Neo and um, Neo is sitting in front of his computer eh, a little bit pasty and uh, he's just trying to figure out he's got a problem he's you know he knows about the matrix he doesn't have any idea what it is and you know but who is he what does he do what is his ordinary world well he sits in front of the computer he hacks things people come to him for uh, favors of uh, uh, you know, I guess his hacking skills or whatever, and he's got his day job, and it's kind of boring, and he just goes through his routine, and his boss is always mad at him for showing up late to work, which implies that he's not a happy guy, he's dissatisfied, he, he definitely begins the story with a sense that there's a greater purpose out there, and that's his ordinary world, he struggles with that every day, and it's in stasis, and if, if the inciting incident never occurred in the Matrix, then he'd continue to just sit there in front of his screen, and wonder what the hell's a matrix and and what am I supposed to be doing with my life and and you know whatever so it establishes the ordinary world in in that sense for this main character before the inciting incident occurs and uh, the inciting incident for the matrix is uh, of course when he uh, is at you know his cubicle at work and the mail delivery guy sends him this phone and it's it's Morpheus 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 yeah uh, Morpheus and he wants to know um, you know he, he, he has plans for for Neo and he wants you know to help him figure out what the matrix is and you know uh, Neo's certainly interested so he tries to follow the instructions but in the process these agents show up agents of the main conflict and threaten his ordinary world. Look at him. He's he doesn't know what to do. You know, does he sit there and squat in fear and on his typical day? No. He's this is threatening his ordinary world, and he's not sure of it. So, um, the inciting incident occurs when the agents capture him and 
question him. Uh, in Jaws, uh, it, it's very much, you know, there's a shark attack. It's not the inciting incident per se, because, you know, he's got to deal with problems uh, uh, to protect the town. The inciting incident really comes in Jaws when he tries to do his job, as his the ordinary world would, would suggest, and uh, close the beach. But there are people who aren't going to agree with that, particularly the mayor. And the mayor stops him from closing the beach. And he agrees. He goes along with it. He does not uh, use his authority uh, as is given to him by his post. And that threatens his ordinary world. It threatens his ability to do his job. And ultimately, it will threaten his family. It will threaten... Um, the lives of the town because of the decision of the mayor and really his opposition to his job. So that's sequence A. And uh, there should be some clear questions in the audience's mind at the end of this sequence so that, uh, you know, we know what they're thinking, we know what they want to know, and we can be in control of delivering that information, answering those questions, and unfolding more of the story in their mind wanting to know more about what happens next. So that's sequence A, The Ordinary World. I uh, Hopefully that uh, clears up, you know, more or less what your story should include and uh, more importantly, how that story is formed in their mind, the kind of information um, and uh, the way you manipulate their attention in terms of uh, what's going on in the story, what's happening, what are the characters' immediate objectives, and uh, what is some of the opposition? And I've just defined conflict, okay, what the audience understands is conflict, that what opposition is opposing that character as they try to uh, reach their immediate goal, whether it's uh, to protect the citizens of Amity from uh, a shark that is uh, preying off the beaches, or uh, Neo as he's trying to understand, uh, you know, this question in himself about you know, what's the matrix and, you know, why is life so terribly boring? And um, and also because of the matrix, it sets up this idea that there's this chick in this great outfit diving through windows, and what's that all about? Um, you know, there's a narrative structure that, you know, I won't go into in great detail, but uh, in, in multiple, in subplots in the story, we're setting up separate lines of conflict and any time you establish a line of conflict, that's a character with an objective and an opposition. Uh, we introduce Trinity in the beginning. She has this objective to escape the agents, and there's opposition, obviously, the agents, the physics of the universe, and that in you know um, diving through windows and, and what she's what power she's able to do. But ultimately, she's able to escape by answering a telephone. That you know that's conflict. And then we have Neo and his conflict. You know, the, the three means character, objective, opposition. And anytime we bring that up in the story, even though they don't appear in the same scene, because they appear in the same movie, we're implying that those storylines will intersect at some point, that they will have an effect on each other. They will culminate. They will come together. And uh, uh, that, that there's a question right there. How do they come together? What happens when they do? Uh, the audience is interested in knowing more. They want to know more of the story. They want more story. Um, and, and that's simply driven by the narrative question. So be sure that you, uh, at the end of the sequence, when the inciting incident occurs, the character makes some sort of decision or tries to, um, well, we'll get into that, what sequence be. It's called the debate. And it's ultimately the character trying to hold on to their ordinary world. Okay. That was a pretty long long-winded explanation of sequence A. I hope the rest of them aren't that long, but uh, no promises.